It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I'm here, as always, the brains behind this operation, and beauty goes to Landon Mance from Las Vegas. Landon, thanks for being here again today, buddy. Uh Uh-huh. Thank you, sir. (laughs) (laughs) And we've got Brooke Spendlove with us from Spendlove Coaching. She's a founder of Spendlove Coaching. It's a health and wellness coaching company, and we'll let you tell us a little bit about that. But before, we always have you start by telling us a little bit about you personally. So whatever that means to you, family, where you grew up, education, any of that kind of stuff, we'd love to hear about it. Sure. Okay. So I grew up in Northern Virginia, DC area. So youngest of five girls, definitely consider myself a, an East coast person. Although I wouldn't say unfortunately, but I have lived out in the West for more than half my life, um, split between Utah and now Arizona for the last almost seven years. I've been married to my husband, Sean, who, you know, Austin, um, for almost 15 years. We're the parents of four children. We have 13 year old identical twin boys an almost 10 year old little boy and a seven and a half year old little girl. So that's me personally, I guess. Yeah. No. And you mentioned that you and I, or not you and I, your husband, Sean, and I went to business school together. I know he's listening today and very proud and excited to have you be on the show today. Um, but what I didn't mention and probably should have is I didn't even mention to Landon that you had identical twins. Landon had twins in April. So you guys have some, com- you know, oh. some uh, conversation starters there. Wow. Yep. So just yep. A, not quite a year old then. We, we are, we are planning their first birthday and it's going to, it's going to be a big one. So I almost said condolences, but it is really exciting. It's just, it's a hard <laughs> twins are another and a whole beast in their own. So, yeah. Yeah, so they they are um, uh, we got boy boy girl. Obviously, they are not uh, identical, but um, uh, my wife's cousin has identical twin girls, the cutest little things you've ever seen in your life. And uh, I don't know about your twins, but these two are so identical that their parents can, I mean, really, their parents can't even tell them apart. They're that identical. I don't know mine. I mean, I've been able to always tell them apart. Um, although they'll make fun of me when I sometimes get it wrong. It's usually if I'm just like not looking at them straight on, or I'm going by sound because I think I know which one sounds different, but in school, their teachers tend to just call them by their last name and don't even try their first (laughs) name (laughs) or like in football, they're like, I got to put a a, a stat, you know, a tag or a sticker on their helmet. Cause they'll yell, Oh, good job, Isaac. And it's Austin running down the, you know, the entire field. And I'm like, I'm yelling, it's, that's the wrong kid. So (laughs) other people can't, but it's always been easy enough for me and my husband. So gotcha. Well, like they play the same position then. Uh, well, actually they don't, that's the irony. Oh. Yeah. They should know that they, <laughs> one's a quarterback and one's a wide receiver, but you know, the coaches don't know them that well yet. It's only been a couple of weeks. So. Gotcha. Well, I'll have to put you on speed dial and call you about once every six to 12 months to say, okay, we ran into this now with the twins. What do we do? <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully the yours are fraternal. I don't know how much competition will come into play, but especially when you've got for me that they're identical. And so the, they've been competitive since they were probably two. And so that's what we deal with day in and day out is how competitive they are. So if anybody has any tips on that, I'll take them. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know Sean to be pretty competitive too. So I'm sure that's where it comes from. Yeah. That's not me. It's totally him. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, Sean actually is a, uh, probably the only person I know in our class that knows what his class ranking was and, and what his GPA was. I, I honestly, I have no idea. I graduated, I got the degree, 
and you and, were out. And I was out. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that kind of stuff matters. Yeah, yeah. To him. <laughs> be proud of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and he should be. I mean, he, he's a great student, great person mm -hmm. as well. But uh, you know, we're gonna find out here pretty quickly that he doesn't hold a candle to you. So all right, let's do it. <laughs> let's let's dive in and talk about the uh, the business side of things here. So you know, you do health and wellness coaching, and you can correct me on you know on the terms that I may be using, but. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you've had a career in healthcare, IT, you know, that sort of thing. But now you're actually in a career that you've started your own coaching company doing intuitive eating as a certified counselor of intuitive eating and a coach. So kind Correct. of help us laymen, you know, the two of us that are, Landon's obviously more beautiful than I am. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, we're not exactly the picture of health, so to speak. We're, we're not uh, the worst that we could be, but we're not the picture of health. So help us understand what that means and how you got to where you are today. Yeah. And I, I told my husband, I'm like, it's not every day that I get the opportunity to talk to two men about what I do, because it, in most of the time, you know, my, in my niche is mainly women, mainly moms. Uh, so it's kind of exciting. It's fun to be able to talk about this because I think it matters because obviously there's women in your life that, that you love and it matters for you personally as well. So um, I'll just back up a little bit to my kind of professional journey a little. So for me, you know, growing up, I always, that was something I was interested in health and, and whether it was through exercise or what have you. Um, and I didn't really know necessarily how to make it a professional you know, how was I making that into a career? It was just something that I enjoyed. And it wasn't until I was, I think I was a social work major. Yeah, I think I was. Um, <laughs> I should remember that. And it was in between two of my years at, uh, in college that I went and did a humanitarian project in Africa. And we had the opportunity while we were there to do some really basic education, some very basic courses for or uh, classes for some of the healthcare workers in this village. And that was the first time I really got and grasped the concept that if you put the information, the right information in the right hands, it, that's, it's going to have a profound impact on that person's circle of influence and who that they in, you know, interact with. Because for those healthcare workers that they were gonna, then going to go out to the, the different homes and huts and villages, they now are empowered with information. So when I, then I went home and changed my major, I changed it to community health education and, and loved that study. And like you said, I kind of went a unique route for my degree. I went into healthcare IT, but it was still that same thread, that same idea that when you put the right information in the right person's hands, they're going to be able to have a really big impact. So the healthcare IT industry, I don't know how much you know about it, but essentially most companies they're you know, they're either working on making data more electronic. So the sharing of data is easier. And the whole goal then is to empower, whether it's the patient or the providers to make better decisions. So less testing, let's keep track of prescriptions. Let's make sure that you have all of those providers working towards that patient's good. And so again, the impact of data in the right hands, it's huge in healthcare IT. And I loved it. I was there for, I think 16, 17 years in different companies doing that and, and implementing on site. But I just knew something was was missing. And so I decided to, I, I really wanted more one-on-one -on -one interaction to see the impact uh, in, the, in the, the client's life. And so I decided a handful of years ago to go back and get my master's degree in health and wellness coaching at Creighton University in Nebraska. We'll see what they're ranked in March Madness today. <laughs> Actually, I think they're already ranked. My kids are doing their brackets, but um, that's like the one sport that they're in <laughs> is basketball. Um, and so I... I, you know, I'll probably talk more about my journey as to like how I became all of those different things with my coaching, but essentially in a nutshell, I, I'm a now a nationally board certified health and wellness coach, but I'm also a certified intuitive eating counselor. And I threw in a, a personal training certification just to round that out. And so I work with uh, women and moms to help them heal their relationship with food and with their bodies. And I do it in a weight loss neutral approach, just with that same, in my, same thread in mind. When you put that information in the right hands, their sphere of influence is huge. Yeah. So that's what I do. And well, I love it. <laughs> I, I think it's great. So there are a couple of things that, that stuck out for me is getting closer to that one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. right? So I, I've been in this industry for a little over 20 years, what I do, financial planning, and financial services, but I wasn't always in a client facing role, much like yourself. And that was what made the transition for me. Something that I desired was that one on one connection and actually seeing the difference 
that I make in people's lives with the things that I do for them, right? right? The advice that I provide and, and you're doing that exact same thing. And then the second thing that, that sticks out for me is, you know, I've been married almost 23 years. It'll be 23 years in August. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a woman. I didn't grow up with any sisters. I had a half sister that kind of partially lived with us throughout our, throughout the time that I was growing up, but she lived mostly with her birth mom. And, and so I didn't spend a whole lot of time with her, but being married, you do understand that this body image thing is real. And it's not that men don't deal with body image, but it's on a different level with females. And, and I think that that's a big part of what it is that you do and provide is that you help them to get over that body image stuff, right? I mean, we're dealing with a 17 year old daughter as well. And we talk about, it's not about what you look like or, or how much you weigh or what your measurements are. It's about how you feel Mm -hmm. and taking care of your body so that your body is the best that your body can be for you personally. Right. You know, that's a great way to apply it to your life. And body image is so tricky. (laughs) And so you talk about, especially with clients, there's the idea of having a positive body image. And usually with most people that I work with, they've been dealing with decades of um, some type of, you know, struggle with their body, disordered eating. We can talk about what that is. But usually what we'll do is just talking about being neutral, accepting like this is my body and respecting your body. So I like to think about it more of just body respect, because when you respect something, you treat it differently. You may not always be perfectly happy with how it looks or how it feels, but you're going to give it what it needs and listen to it. And so that's how I usually phrase it is let's focus on respecting your body and then with that will usually come the shift with your, your body image and how you see yourself. Yeah. I think that's a good way to put it. I've never heard it put quite that way that it's about respecting your body. Cause that does change things. Right. Right. I mean, I guess I've got to learn to respect that I am bald and will <laughs> likely be bald the rest of my life. <laughs> there are some things you can't change. <laughs> I, I have been told by a few people recently that I could take a trip to Turkey. Apparently Turkey's like the the top place in the world for hair, hair, uh, implants or whatever it's called. Oh. So, but you it, pull off bald. Well, like. yeah. listen, bald is beautiful. That's is. what I, that's what I tell people. <laughs> Landon should really take that to pay off and use less just for men. He'll see what it's really, <laughs> what life is really like. Shots fired. I like it. <laughs> what do you think Landon? You've been married at this point. How long? Eight, eight, no, just, um, we have been married. It'll be six years in May. Six years. Newbie. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, yep. Six years going strong and looking forward to the next, you know, 50, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so Brooke, I got a, I got a question for you. Um, you, uh, alluded to, um, a term that I've never heard. And you called it uh, diet culture. Yes. Uh, talk to us, please, about what 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 is that? What does that mean? And why, um, you know, uh, why can that be dangerous to us as people? Right. I'm glad you asked that. That's a, a tricky. Well, I wouldn't say it's a tricky question, but the thing with diet culture is we are immersed in it. And sometimes it's really hard to see. And so when I explain it, you might be like, well, isn't that just normal? Isn't that just life? Um, And so that's where it becomes a little bit eye-opening. So this will be fun. So basically diet culture is the idea that, uh, you know, a $72 billion diet industry has propagated that, you know, people are more, they are good. (laughs) They are moral. They are worthy based on their body size. And that's actually the definition from the National Eating Disorder Association. So where that then becomes a problem, obviously, is that healthcare providers, people who see you on the street, they look at your overall appearance and make determinations about your health. Oh, you're a specific size, so you must be unhealthy, Um, things like that. So what that then becomes really dangerous is then it becomes normal to constantly be pursuing weight loss, to constantly be hating your body, to constantly being just dissatisfied. And then, like I said, with health, you know, well-meaning healthcare providers or well-meaning parents, 
they explain away a lot of problems by, oh, you just need to lose weight. And it becomes almost a prescription. Well, if you just lost weight, then all these things would go away. When 95% of people who go on some kind of weight loss plan regain it and regain it more within five years. So that's, I mean, there's a lot of dangers I can talk about it, but when it comes to the type of coaching I do with diet culture, one of the first principles of intuitive eating, and I can talk more about like what intuitive eating is, but is to reject the diet mentality. So with diet culture, we're surrounded by it. So how do you then internalize it? And that becomes your own mentality, how you see yourself and how it damages your perception of your worth and your value. And that's where it really, really becomes damaging for, you know, half the population or more. So does that answer your question, Landon? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I assume we're going to, we're, we'll, as we kind of progress in our conversation, the, the term intuitive eating will continue to kind of come up and we'll discuss it more, but yeah, I mean, I don't have a clue what that means. So maybe you can just kind of speak to that for, for a minute so that we can understand what that uh, means as we move forward. Yeah. Well, let me tell you a little bit more about my personal journey, how I decided to take my coaching that direction, and then kind of talk about what intuitive eating is. So, you know, when I decided to go back to school, um, I was, I just had my fourth child. I was like most people, again, kind of steeped in diet culture and diet mentality. I need to fix myself. I need to get back to whatever body I thought I was supposed to have. And I'm doing that in air quotes for, you know, audio <laughs> listening. Yeah. Um, and so I was looking at my schooling as, okay, I will figure this out and then I'll go help women do the same thing. I will get myself back to this, this, this solution, this fix. And I really credit my master's program to helping me see some of the, the errors in my ways. My master's program really focused on whole person health. And the idea that you're not just made up of your nutrition or whether or not you're exercising 150 minutes a week or what have you. And so I was able to look at the balance of my health and, you know, what was my sleep like? Crappy. I'll just answer that question. Um, <laughs> what was my stress level? I, I was working full time with four kids going to my master's program. It was insane. So I was able to look at what I was also doing with my eating. Um, I can list off all of the things I was doing. I mean, keto, I was macro counting, I was tracking and weighing and everything. And you look at that and realize I can't sustain this. And I also felt like my brain <laughs> was splitting with all of the things I was trying to just do perfectly. And I realized also, I didn't want to do this and actually tell clients to do this and to coach people to do this. And so I had to look at it as I was in my master's program. How can I how can I shift and make something, whatever I'm coaching, be a lifelong pursuit, a lifelong path? And I had heard of intuitive eating. I had the book for years. And like most people, it sounds really good. And then I, but you always think, well, I'm just going to do this one last diet, get down to my goal weight, and then I'll become an intuitive eater. And that's just not how it works. <laughs> and that's actually in the first chapter of the book. So let me explain what intuitive eating is. There are 10 principles to intuitive eating and I can list them off or we can, you know, I can talk about them, but basically the idea is as humans, the majority of us are born with this natural ability to know when we're hungry, know when we're full, know what we like to eat in general and know how food feels in our bodies. But we get away from that, whether it's through diets, uh, just any external factors that we look to, to tell us this is what you should be eating instead of actually paying attention to our own internal cues. So it's essentially a path back to what we were all born as. And it's hard because like I said, when you work with people who are decades into this up and down of, well, now I'll be on a diet. Now I won't be, now I will, now I won't. It's, it's a, it is a long journey to that. So um, just to give you a list of what those 10 principles are. Like I said, we don't have time to go through all of them. The first one is reject the diet mentality, like I said, because you really have to recognize it and realize that this can't be how you live the rest of your life. You have to make a choice. You have to do that from the beginning. And then we have honor your hunger, make peace with food, challenge the food police, respect your fullness, discover the satisfaction factor, cope with your emotions with kindness, respect your body, like I said, and movement, feel the difference. And then the last one with good reason is honor your health with gentle nutrition. And so what I do with my clients is I weave it in with a whole person health um, approach with programs. So we talk about stress and sleep and weave in those 10 principles, but it is really just a, a journey back to 
learning how to trust your own body's cues and to, to give your body what it needs rather than looking for the external sources to tell you what to do. Yeah. Sources like McDonald's commercials telling me that I want a Big Mac. Is that what you're telling yeah, me? Yeah. Or Weight Watchers telling you that you <laughs> yeah. only get this many points that day. Yeah. 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 True. Yeah. No, I think, I think the whole process makes a ton of sense. You're right. I mean, we do know, and, and we've, we've recently talked to our kids about this. My son, you know, just got home from being in Denmark for two years as a missionary for our church. I did the same thing 25 years ago, but I was in Belgium and France and I, you know, while I was gone, I gained 30 pounds, right? Now I was still growing. I was a very, very late bloomer. And so I, I was still growing a little bit too, but you know, the pastries and all, I mean, they just, (laughs) they feed you so much in Belgium and France. And I figured that was going to be the same for him. He lost 20 pounds because he happened to be partnered up with people who were very health conscious. Mm. Now, my son was an athlete, played baseball, played golf, has played every sport you can imagine his whole life, just just like your twins do. And, you know, he so he he's never been overweight, never, you know, been in in bad shape per se. But just that switch of, oh, you know, doing push ups and sit ups and lifting a little bit of, you know, doing some body weight stuff and then running, which he'd never done outside of the requirement for baseball or, you know, PE classes or whatever, has completely changed the way that he looks at things. And now he works out every day with friends and here and like for the first time I'm starting, you know, not that this matters, but you start to see six pack abs, you see more definition in his legs that I've never seen before. Again, never been overweight healthy kid but it's completely changed and now he's starting to recognize man I could have so we were in Maui last week I could have finished that whole plate of fish and chips that I just ordered but I realized I didn't need to and so he ate half of it and saved the rest for lunch the next day right like those types of changes are part of what you're talking about I know that doesn't encapsulate you know encapsulate all of that but it's it's those small changes in realizing, oh, I am full. Mm-hmm. Just because they put that full plate in front of me doesn't mean I need to eat that full plate. Right. Yeah. That's definitely key to understanding your body's cues is knowing when you're hungry, which that's hard for a lot of people to recognize early on that they're hungry until, the, you know, a lot of times we wait until you're ready to eat your arm off. And then it's really hard to then honor the cue of I'm full now. Yeah. So that that's a great thing that your son's been able to do. And that usually comes with being well nourished. If he's eating regularly and he's getting the food he needs, it is really easy to listen to your cues. But if you're in a, a state of constantly restricting and you're constantly micromanaging your diet through, you know, counting or weighing and looking at your app for how many, you know, protein grams am I supposed to be eating the next meal? It's very hard. Then you're not listening to your cues. You're listening to the app to tell you what to do. So, yeah that's where it gets, there's a balance. Well, and I I think those apps even, it puts it, I mean, and I understand why they're out there and and they are helpful to a lot of people. I've used them myself, my fitness pal and different things like that. Right. And and it can be helpful, but it also then makes you feel restricted and it makes you feel like if you do something beyond that, that you've done something wrong. And I think that that's probably what you're getting to is that it's a, it should be about um, positive reinforcement rather than negative reinforcement that comes in a lot of the diet culture and these different things you're talking about. Right. And, and there are clients that I'll work with that still want to even track their food somewhat. And when I say track, they'll just keep some kind of journal. Like this is what I ate and this is how I felt. And that can still be comforting if someone's been restricting and they're used to journaling, but it's never, this is how many calories I ate. This is how many I have left because our, our body ebbs and flows, our need, our calorie needs change. So if there's a day where I run six miles, I'm, I'm going to notice I'm a lot hungrier, (laughs) but if my, my app's telling me I can't eat that, which one do I honor? Do I honor the app or do I honor what my body's telling me to do? But I want to go back to what you said about, then you're feeling bad because you ate something you ate over. And that's where another thing you mentioned, Lance, about the dangers of diet culture is dieting. There's that idea of you either were successful or you failed. And 
if you ate your, your amount that you're supposed to eat, or you lost weight that day, then poof, you succeeded and you're supposed to feel good. But then on the flip side, you know, if you didn't meet those needs or you, or you went over, then you failed, or if you gained the weight back, there's the failure. And that's one of the things I love about intuitive eating the way that we're supposed to eat overall, there's no failing there's learning from it. There's, oh, that food didn't actually feel good. Or I did eat past the point of fullness and I didn't feel good. Or I was really hungry and I actually honored it. And I had the energy I needed the rest of the afternoon instead of crashing. And so there's no failing. And, and that's where it gets really powerful as you realize there's no, there's no doing it wrong. There's only learning from it. And that's one of the big differences I, I coach around when it comes to diet culture versus learning how to be an intuitive eater. Yeah. Yeah, real quick, Landon, I know you have a comment that you want to make here, but um, one of the things that I noticed over the last year with the pandemic for me personally was, you know, working from home all of a sudden, and, and I've worked from home a decent amount anyway, um, but working from home all of a sudden and feeling like you can't go out to do certain things, one, we started ordering a lot more takeout, and we tried to be healthy about it, but we didn't do that great of a job, right? Um, and then honestly, where my home office was at home was, I've discovered over the last few months was too close to the kitchen, <laughs> honestly. And right. I, and I moved my office further away from the kitchen. You physically moved I it. physically wow. moved my office to another room in the house. And for me, for whatever reason, that was enough to where I wouldn't get up and go to the, to the kitchen to grab something. I would just keep working because... I didn't need a snack or something at that point. And not to toot my own horn, but that's led to 18 pounds worth of weight loss just <laughs> since January of this year, right? Now I've gotten a little bit more active and right. you know we've done some things and being able to return to the gym a little bit. And so some of those things have certainly helped, but it's just those little things where you don't even realize we're doing them, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd I'd be in the kitchen because it was close to the office and I just needed to get up and walk a little bit, but I'd walk towards the kitchen and, oh gosh, there's a tub of M&Ms sitting on the counter. And I, you know, you grab a handful of peanut M&Ms and you don't think anything of it until all of a sudden, you know, you, you've gained a bunch of weight during this pandemic and, mm -hmm. and now you have to go and lose it again. I have a couple comments on that. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the first thing that I love to coach around is the idea of that emotional eating occurs on a spectrum. So when we're not talking about actual physical hunger, we're talking about eating outside of physical hunger. So the, the lesser end or the one end of the spectrum is just going to be eating for like celebration for pleasure. It's a very normal reason to eat. You have an anniversary or there's a, you know, you met some kind of milestone and you eat because of that. And then it kind of moves up. And so you're talking about eating for boredom. And that might be what you're talking about is, is you were bored and you just needed something to do. Maybe you just needed to move. You, there was something you were avoiding at work. You didn't want to do it. So let's just go walk around. And then it moves up to comfort. Again, I, when I coach about this, I never say that there's a, a wrong reason to eat. And so that's one of the reasons why one of the principles of emotional eating, or excuse me, of intuitive eating is just coping with your emotions with kindness. So for someone who is dealing with a lot of emotional trauma, sometimes food really is the only coping mechanism they have. And so it's helping them realize no judgment if that's what you've been using, but let's talk about what are some other mechanisms and tools that would help. And I'm not saying obviously that that's what you were dealing with, but the spectrum continues to, I'm going to eat to numb because I don't want to feel that. And then up to, to punishment. And so with any of those, like you said, it's awareness. It's, oh, I went to the pantry. So I'll do this sometimes and be like, I'm in the pantry. I know I'm not hungry. And I'm just aware that there's this thing that I'm doing that I don't want to do at my desk. So I just move to get away from it. Usually with that level of awareness, you eat a more intuitive amount, I guess I should say. I'll look at it and be like, I know I'm not hungry. I just want something. And just that helps me be more in tune with, I'm not going to eat to the point where I feel sick because I just want to avoid whatever it is that I'm avoiding at that moment. Yeah. And I can't remember the other thing I was going to say, but we can move on. Go <laughs> 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 sure Landon's got something to say. Yeah. Don't worry. It happens to uh, Austin and I uh, all the time. We're like, you know, Austin will, will jump in. Hey, hold on, Landon, before you make that comment, let me say this. And by the time it gets back to me, I've already forgotten. Like it's gone. <laughs> it left me. <laughs> Luckily this time I have not forgotten. So, um, 
I figured th th this question that I have, I'm going to ask you to kind of talk about. Uh, I figured we could spend the next probably two, two or three hours talking about it. No, I'm, I'm kidding, but uh, I, I do want to get your thoughts on it. So, money and food, right? Two of the biggest, you know, uh, you know, influential things in our life. A lot of our habits and thought are developed, I, I, I think at a pretty young age. And so you, you earlier, you mentioned that a lot of these women that you're working with, they've had this approach or mentality towards food that has been constructed over, you know, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven decades. And you're trying to help them kind of look at things differently. And Austin and I do the same thing in our practice, right? Because we, you know, I think my oldest client is 85. And, um, you know, people have these, uh, these, these thoughts and, and feelings and emotions and habits towards money that sometimes we have to work with them to try to break some of them, you know, that they've been adopting for decades, right? So, my question to you is, you know, when someone sits down across the table from you and says, Brooke, like, this is what I have going on. You know, I've tried every diet out there over the last 25 years, nothing works. What, what, like, how do you start that conversation with someone to try to change this mentality that they've had for so long? That's, that's a great question. And what you said about that intro about that person is that first step is I usually will have clients almost do a dieting history. And usually it's just a verbal history. Sometimes they actually will fill out an actual chart that I give them. And what they're always, always able to do is track what they've done, what the dieting, the restriction or whatever it is and see what it quote unquote gave them and then how it failed them. And so they're able to see the pattern themselves of diets over and over again, failing them. And what's the end result of that? So usually that's the introspection they have to do at the beginning is then take a look at, okay, how did I feel? How did failing on those diets, how did that make me feel? And then we talk about, well, how do you want to feel about your body? So we usually, the best thing is looking at what it's done to you. And then we want to create a future vision of, I want to feel this way about my body. And it's never about weight. It's never about how it looks. It's just, I want to feel neutral. I want to be content. That's one of my favorite words. When a client will say, I just want to be content with my body. I'm tired of hating my body for the last 20 years. Um, and so we just look at that, that piece of, okay, let's create a future vision. And then, like I said, using that first principle of intuitive eating of recognizing diet culture that usually brings into the discussion the idea of the voices in your head, we call them the food police in intuitive eating, but it's those voices saying you shouldn't eat this because either you're too fat or it has too much fat in it. I mean, it's those types of voices. It's the rules. It's the, look at the, look at the carb count, look at the sugar count. Um, any of those rules that you hear. And like I said, diet culture is everywhere. You're probably thinking right now, like I've got my own set of rules that I look at when I'm picking food. So oh, what's the menu? I'm going to look at the lower fat options or what have you. So it's, it's recognizing those food voices and talking about where they come from. So one of the things I wanted to say though, Landon, in answer to your question is how, when they have a history of that, we have, we always have to take a look at your brain has those neural pathways. They immediately jump to the habits of whether it's counting or it's tracking or the, the, the thoughts of you're too fat for this. You can't have this. Your brain immediately goes to those because it's used to doing that for two decades of hating yourself or hating your body or, or being dissatisfied. And so, in fact, I, I do this with clients a lot as we talk about, okay, that's your unintentional thought. Now we want to talk about what do you want to get to? What's your intentional thought? And talk about a pathway to get there. So if it's a, usually you're going to have to create some kind of neutral thought to help you ease into a more intentional thought when it comes to your body and when it comes to just approaching your, your health and your wellness in general. And then usually the next best thing is to help them take a step back and zoom out and just start paying attention to what's happening when they're eating pay attention to, am I hungry when I go and sit down? What are the feelings I'm having? And one of the most powerful questions I've heard and used is where does your mind go when you're eating? And 
you know, if you think about all the times, if your mind is split between, you know, okay, am I allowed to eat this? Is it on my plan? How many points does it have? You know, all of the different things is it within my fasting window or my eating window, you're not fully present with the people there. You're not fully present in your meal. And so getting someone to actually experience, even if it's just one meal or just a couple bites being present while they're eating is huge as well. So those are some of the first steps that we talk about. Um, but just helping them see that dieting has failed them. They haven't failed. Yeah. is big. <clears throat> I think that's a big deal. And, you know, Len kind of alluded to this in, in just posing the question. And I, I could see you using this same type of a thought process in what you do. You know, we, we have kind of this creed that we live by, Landon and I do. And, and, you know, it's not, sometimes we'll share it with clients, but it's not something that we always say to the clients. But, you know, we live by this creed that basically says this person's financial life is a mess. They don't even know it. It's not their fault. And somebody strong is going to help them get on the right path to go to go forward. That's that's essentially the, the gist of it. Right. You could do the exact same thing from a health standpoint, because the reality is most of us don't even realize that we feel the way that we feel or why we feel the way that we feel about food and our relationship with it and our body and, you know, kind of how that leads our entire life. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference though, in coaching though, is I, my goal is always to help you realize that the answer is inside of you, that you know it, and I'm just there to help you recognize it. And so yeah. my goal is always when they walk away from a session or from learning on one of my, my videos, et cetera, is they feel like, oh, I figured that out. My coach was there helping me discover that, but it was inside of me because that's really where the empowerment comes is I'm not the one giving them because then they're always dependent on me. And really that's not the goal because it, that knowledge is there for them to, to discover. Yeah. Yeah. Very good point. All right. So this is something that you alluded to early on. You talked about, you know, doctors and everybody talking about if you just lost weight, you would, everything would be better, right? Your blood pressure would be better, your diabetes, your cholesterol, or you would just feel better overall, your joints. I mean, you hear it everywhere. It's all about, you just weigh too much. Your body's not supposed to sustain that much weight. Fix it. Right. right? So what do you tell people when they're hearing that from their doctor? What, what's your response to them? I always have to start with, I don't, I'm not against your doctor. <laughs> I'm not against the medical community. I'm not against your parents that are concerned. There's a lot of really well-meaning people that are coming at it with the right intentions, but perhaps the wrong information. One of the best ways I've heard it phrased is if, if, a, if a prescription had a 95% chance of failing, would you still give it to a patient? And most doctors would flat out say no. I mean, why would you expect that one patient to be the 5% minority? They wouldn't, but they continue to do that. A lot of time it's because it's policy. That's their policy to basically prescribe weight loss. So when we talk about the, you know, how they can approach their providers, it can be really tricky. And so usually we talk about just feeling empowered. You can ask not to be weighed. You can tell them I'm on a journey to do something that is weight loss neutral, but essentially what I coach around is the idea that, yeah, we want to improve your health. Your health is not just your weight. And so let's talk about health promoting behaviors. And if you look at the research, there are studies that show when you incorporate those health promoting behaviors, independent of what the, the, the clients or the patients actually weigh, their indicators improve, their blood pressure, their um, cholesterol levels, their, you know, their glucose levels. That's what improves. It's not the weight. It's the actual health promoting behavior. So we're talking about improving their sleep improving their stress levels and how they cope with their stress. It's looking at them as a whole person rather than, okay, I can see looking at you that you are heavier than you should be. And that's, that's what I tell them to do. And sometimes I don't say ignore your doctors, but let's look at it from a more holistic approach because there's a lot more going on than you stepping on the scale. Yeah. I mean, I, I take that as it's, it's what you're going to do that will lead to the fact that you lose weight, right? But it's, you're doing certain things that will improve the blood pressure, the cholesterol, and the byproduct of that is that you will also lose weight likely. Well, and I have to correct you on that. Not okay. necessarily. Nope. With intuitive eating, there's three outcomes. You could gain weight, you could stay the same, or you could lose weight. And that really depends on where you're starting. If you're working with someone who has been heavily restricting and the weight they've gotten themselves down to was at, you know, a 1200 calorie limit or less or something like that, when they start to allow themselves to actually eat like a normal person, 
their weights nor going to normalize. So the goal with my coaching and with this type of program is always to get yourself to a point that your weight settles at a place that you don't have to be constantly working at it. And that might be heavier than what social media or what you think you should be looking like. And that's where, again, we come back to the diet culture. Diet culture tells you you should be a specific size, right? But we know that health is not specific to size. Uh, just a really quick story that I, I love. When I did my training with uh, the creators of intuitive eating, Evelyn Tribbley gave us this story one time that she, she's a, a dietitian by practice and she'd had a, a client come in and say, you know, I want to do this. I really want to do intuitive eating, but I just want to get down to looking like this particular friend of mine. And she said the patients, she said the girl's name. And she said, what I couldn't tell her was that girl that she mentioned was a client of mine and had been on an eating disorder for 10 years, fighting an eating disorder. So we really never know what's going on inside when you look at someone from their physical characteristics. So I never promise weight loss. In fact, one of the first things I, I talk to patients or clients about is that we put weight loss on the back burner because if weight loss is still your goal, you will never heal your relationship with food because your desire to lose weight is always going to win and you're not going to be able to normalize your relationship and the energy around a particular food. That's a whole nother story if you want to talk about the cycle of restricting and craving and all that fun stuff. So. <laughs> I've lived it. Yes. With a daughter and a, and a wife. So yeah, they, I, I think they would definitely benefit from talking to you. Um, I'm just going to make sure that, you know, my wife is smoking hot. So, you know, <laughs> I'm she, sure she, she doesn't need to lose weight, but uh, just like every other woman, she's constantly looking at what she the scale says she does. Yeah. or, you know, all those sorts of things. So it, it's, it's a constant struggle and it, and it is, it's, it, our society has led us to believe that we need to look a certain way or, you know, as, as we age or we go through these different changes that our body goes through as we get older or go through certain things or a big stressful pandemic worldwide, you know, all these types of things that happen and we, we don't give ourselves a break, right. right? We, we always just try to hold ourselves to this ideal that we're seeing on social media where we're seeing everybody with filters or on their best day or, you know, whatever it is, you know, I mean, here's a newsflash. We don't go to Maui every week, right? That's not what the Peterson family does. That's not the life we live. But last week, that was the That's life we you led. Did, right. And I'm sure there are people on the other end of the screens going, man, the Petersons, man, they're in Maui and they've Such got, a good you know, life. their mm -hmm. life is perfect. And, and that's just not the truth, but we can't get past that social media screen today. And I think that, you know, we've, we've had an issue with obesity and, and unhealthy eating habits and all those kinds of things in our country for a long, long time. But I think it's been augmented hugely in the past decade with social media. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree. And I think there's a lot of phobia around the changing of sizes. I and mean, if you look at historically women and what their figures were considered beautiful 50 years ago, it was very different from what we look at now. Yeah. And so, you know, it was interesting. Uh, about a year ago, I was asked to do just a quick presentation to a bunch of eight to 11 year old little boys and girls about health. Someone said, oh, you're a health coach. Why don't you come talk to them? And I'm sure they had no idea what they're getting themselves into when I went there, you know, expecting that I would talk to them about the importance of eating all their vegetables. But instead, we just had a really good conversation about bodies come in different shapes and sizes. And I used my family as an example, being the youngest of five girls, we're all very different sizes and we look completely different. We're different heights. We have different builds and that that's okay. In fact, that's great. And that's what makes us amazing is all of those could be healthy. And, and why, you know, that's the message I want my kids to get is healthy is a lot, comes in a lot of different ways. And so we can't look to one version and say that that's what it is. Yeah, true. So, um, Brooke, I love how you, um, this approach that you take and you call it, um, something like the whole, the whole person, you know, approach, which is, uh, is really relevant because so Austin and I, uh, we partner with Lincoln Financial Advisors. That's our, our broker dealer. And every year uh, they do these national meetings where you can come to them, you know, if you want. And uh, they did one virtually uh, just last week or the week before. And typically they have a closing keynote speaker. Usually it's like a 
former athlete who's now a motivational speaker or someone that's on the circuit doing the, you know, speeches or whatnot. Uh, this year, though, they had a guy come on and um, he was just basically talking about living a healthier lifestyle. And he talked about, you know, he talked about eating and nutrition. He talked about sleep and reducing stress and all this stuff. And he showed this infographic, which I thought was just, I'm still like, just captivated me. And it showed 1940 and then some other years in between. And then it showed like last year. And he broke someone's day down to these different categories. And it was sleep, survival, which was like, you know, basically eating, white noise, which was like playing sports, doing, you know, hanging out with your family or whatever. And I think that's it. And then, so that was 1940. Fast forward to 2019 or 2020, we are sleeping less, working more. Um, screen time averages about five hours a day per person. And then it squeezed down the white noise, AKA family time down to like an hour or two per day. So I thought that was just so eye opening to see that. Um, but uh, my, my, comment here my question for you is you know when you're when you're advising these people that you you know your your clients and you're talking to them about this whole health how can we translate that over to business owners right because this is a show interviewing business owners geared towards you know private business owners and their you know their teams so what what can you say to these business owners that are burning the you know the wick at both ends they are jeopardizing their relationships with their families their health all these other things because they're so ingrained in their businesses like help them to take a step back here and give them some pointers so they can focus more on their just overall you know health yeah well, as a business owner myself, I obviously relate with that and have to look at it in myself all the time and realize, do I have a, a balance here? So one of the first things I do with my clients is we just take a look at what's called a wellness wheel and it's got six different areas. So we're talking emotional health, stress, your nutrition, your movement, um, your sleep, and then also just knowing that you're living your purpose, living your why, or whether that's spiritual health, what have you. And I have them just take an accounting of one to 10, where they feel like they're at in each of those areas. And I can tell you that most people, you know, are lower on sleep, higher on stress than they feel like they should be, or that they're comfortable with. And so first is just being aware, like this is a problem. So in my research and in my studies in my graduate program, we talked a lot about the effects overall of stress and really how we don't necessarily understand the long-term effects of these stress. And, and the word chronicity of stress was something that we talked about with the director of our program is that's what he was starting to do his research on is what happens when you're at that level of stress for decades again. And whether it's, you know, I, that's one of the reasons why I incorporate it somewhat into my program is because Sometimes that stress is just you trying to constantly fight your body back. That's a level of stress as well. So what we know about the human body is its ability to adapt to stress and to react to it. And what does it do? It produces stress hormones. It produces cortisol. And if we don't allow our body the time to come down from that, then we don't know long-term what's really happening to our body other than it's not good. You know, if, if you never come down, if you're at that constant level of just low to mid-level stress, it's highly dangerous. We just don't know when you do that on a chronic level, what's that really going to do to you? So what I usually talk about with clients is when do you come down? Whether it's just five minutes, whether it's you come home and say, okay, I'm going to get off. I'm going to turn off my phone for 10 minutes. So when you're talking about an entrepreneur who feels like they're on all the time, I mean, it's all the decisions, especially like where I'm, you know, in the first couple of years of my business, I'm not outsourcing a lot. It, most of it's coming out of my brain. It's the ability to intentionally say, okay, for this 30 minutes, you know, start small <laughs> for this 30 minutes, I'm going to 
do something else. And whether it's meditation, allowing yourself that actual mental break, the opportunity to come down. And when I say come down, I mean, lower your stress levels, just let yourself be. So I have clients that they can't just meditate because their mind will go somewhere else. Being still can be a challenge when you're really starting out and a struggle. So it's finding something that just allows you to relax, find a, a show that you like for 20 minutes. So with any goal, it's always, you start small. When you see that you actually completed that five to 10 minutes of coming down, then you realize, okay, I've got a little confidence. I can build it up. But most of the time there's going to be, there has to be an element of actually scheduling it in or it's not going to happen. So just as you would schedule in an appointment with a business partner, treat it that way and mm -hmm. treat yourself as a partner. That's something that's worth keeping that appointment with. She's speaking my language there. I'm so speaking I, right at Austin. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I literally do that. So my mom for, has been worried for years about the amount of time that I put into my career and building my, you know, doing those sorts of things. And your stress levels are off the charts and you need to, you need to deal with this because I'm, I'm worried about you. Right. And, and she doesn't, my mom lives in another state, so she doesn't see me all the time. She doesn't know all the things that I do to, to offset right. that stress. Um, but one, I do believe in scheduling things in. And so if you saw my calendar first thing in the morning, it schedules in exercise. It schedules in walking the dog. It schedules in my meditation or my spiritual time. You know, those types of things are, are in my calendar every day specifically for a reason, because as a busy business owner, I have to schedule them in or they won't get done. Right. Right. And, and the other side of, of what you just talked about reminded me of a book that both of you guys need to read. If you haven't read, it's called driven. It's the Larry H Miller story. Okay. And that is a story of somebody who did exactly that. He died at a young age, complications from diabetes, not taking care of himself, not exercising, going a whole day without eating, right. not drinking enough water, all the things that, you know, that he just didn't do. He, he's, he's, you know, he was, he was the owner of the Utah Jazz, built a tremendous business empire, huge, you know, lots of money, all those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, he died in his early 60s because he didn't take care of himself. Mm -hmm. And his wife has now been alive for another, you know, 15 or so years without him only because he didn't deal with the toxic stress and taking care of his body. Right. It, it truly is a big, big issue. Yeah, it is. And everybody has their own threshold when it comes to stress. I mean, my mom's kind of the same way. Oh, you're taking on too much. I worry about you. And I have a, just a different way to deal with stress. I, my, my way to do it is I make decisions as fast as I can. Worry is something that weighs me down. Indecision is stressful for me. So I just, no, I'm done. I made that decision. I move on. So if you develop ways to combat the stress, you might have just a higher threshold of stress, but everybody has, you know, has to come down. So my question to you though, is do you have a certain time you shut off at night? I do actually. And, and it's, it's it's a bit of a struggle with my wife because we try to, well, what I do is choosing TV shows to watch where I can just completely let everything go and focus on a TV show that I enjoy watching, right? right? And sometimes it's comedies that just let me not even think about anything and, and laugh, right? Because mm -hmm. I think laughing is an important thing. And other times it's certain dramas that, that I like that I get excited about, right? Um, and that, and we do that every night. My wife's flip side to that would be, I would like to do more than just sit and watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to, that, right. That's not true quality time together. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I've obviously got, that's a relationship thing, not a, <laughs> not a stress, not thing. a stress thing. Yeah. But we, we do do that from a, from a stress standpoint at, at night. And, and I do, you know, I'll, maybe I'll check my phone once or twice throughout the evening, but it typically sits to the to the side away from me and I'm just watching the TV sitting on the couch watching with you know with mm -hmm. my wife. And that's great because you when you're able to have that time to wind down, your quality of sleep also improves. I'm sure you've yeah. seen studies about shutting off the screens, especially your handheld screens earlier to be able to improve your quality of sleep. I mean, I know there's times that I'm working until right before I go to bed and I just dream about work and yeah. I'm like that wasn't a break. What just happened there? So Yep, absolutely. Well, Brooke, uh, as we kind of push up against time here, um, this has been a great conversation. Now, you know, when 
when Austin and I work with clients and I'm just making up a, a hypothetical, you know, situation where we start working with them and maybe they have X amount of dollars saved and we help them over the course of a year or two years or five years or 10 accumulate X more dollars. So we can, one way that we can help track someone's success is just kind of by, you know, looking at, you know, what we help them accumulate. Now we're, we're also trying to do some behavioral coaching and change some habits and whatnot, but you know, that's one way that we can track the success, you know, of working with someone is, okay, your net worth was X at this point in time. And now it's Y at this point in time, hopefully it improved. So when you're working with people, um, how do you, you know, how do you measure success and how do these people know it's working, you know, what you are helping them to focus on and, and, or kind of achieve. Right. And like I mentioned before, when you're talking about diet culture, there's a really easy measure for success. It's going to be pounds lost. It's going to be, well, my size changed. Um, I was able to, you know, I measured differently. There's a really easy measure for that success and also a really easy measure for your failure. And when I'm dealing with clients, it becomes an individual thing. And so that's what I tell them. Well, what does success in this look like to you? And they have to decide that for themselves. And most of the time, you know, it's interesting to hear some of the things that they'll say. It's, it's getting to the point where they feel normal in an eating environment. There's not the, the chatter, the food police in their head saying, this is what you can eat, or this is what you can't eat. They can approach food without all of the emotion. In general, when you're talking about food that's been restricted, there's either a lot of excitement because you haven't let yourself eat it and I'm going to go eat it. Or there's a lot of fear. Like I can't let myself have that. I'll just go crazy if I let myself have that. The goal with anything that we do is to get to that point of neutrality that they can say, this is food. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to feel satisfied. And then I can move on and stop when that food doesn't feel, it doesn't taste good anymore. And so I'll ask them to think about, you know, what are those types of things that would feel successful? A lot of it's going to be internal mindset shifts. I'm, I'm going to accept my body. Like we mentioned before, I want to feel content. I want to feel that I'm treating my body with the respect that it has. So they're not as easily measurable, but far more impactful because they're lifelong and they're not going to go anywhere. And then they have full control over that too. Yeah. So what is it, what does it look like for somebody to engage, you know, with, with you in, in, you know, whether it's in a a one-on-one, you know, program or a group program or, you know, however you, you, you do that, you know, what does it look like for someone to engage with you? Do they have to sign up for, you know, a class or a program or how many sessions, like just kind of give us an idea of what it, what it feels and looks like to, to work with you. Sure. So I do a lot of free stuff. So I obviously will, you know, I have Facebook lives and videos that I put out once a week, just doing some basic education because everybody needs to hear this. The more people I can get it in the hands of, I'm happy to do that. And I have a habit of loving, I just love creating content, whether it's worksheets to help people processing. So I feel like I have a pretty decent amount of free content just so people can get to know me when they feel like they're ready to actually work with me and move forward. I have two programs right now. And what I've noticed in my coaching was there was a lot of education because it really is a huge shift when you're talking about getting rid of this idea of this diet culture. And so I found it was most impactful for me to create an online course. So there's videos, there's audio worksheets that go along with it that they're then given access to. And then what we do is then tack on the one-on-one coaching at a, an interval rate so that they're able to do the learning from, you know, my voice, but I'm not there with them. And then when they come to the coaching session, they bring their questions, they bring what's been coming up as they've been processing this new information. And we can talk about goals moving forward. So the two programs that I do right now is I have kind of a beginner program, someone who is dealing with dieting. They know it's not going to, it's not working, but they're just really nervous. There's a lot of fear around jumping into something and, you know, jumping away, I should say, 
from dieting. And so I call that program kick diets to the curb. It's basically a preparation. It's all about mindset. It's about creating that future vision. This is what I want for my life going forward. How do I actually let go of dieting? And it's a shorter program, but it still includes one-on-one coaching with me. And then once someone feels like they're ready, or if they come to me already ready, just really, they know a lot about intuitive eating. And then I have a longer program that the end result of that one is really that my clients feel like they're the experts of themselves again. Cause that's really what it is, is I'm not looking to someone else to tell me what to do. I know that that wisdom is inside of me. And so that program is my, more my, my full program. It to focuses on that whole person health and then weaves in all the principles of intuitive eating. And again, it, it's an, you know, an online membership. And then we have one-on-one coaching sessions that are throughout the, the six months. And does it work like a monthly subscription then or an upfront fee? How does that work? It's an upfront fee or they can pay it for, you know, for the six months if they want to do that. Gotcha. Great. Cool. Very cool. So Brooke, um, what is the easiest, best way for people to, uh, to track you down if they want to learn more about your programs or have a consultation or just connect with you? Sure. I have my website is just spend, spend love. I have to spell. I feel like I have to spell that out. Cause I kind of mumble it. Spend like you spend money, spend love coaching.com. And I have information there, but also I'm really regular on social media. So my Instagram account is at Brooks spend love coaching. And I, it's the same on Facebook as well. So those are probably the easiest ways to see what I've been doing and the content that I'm putting out there and just to get to know more about me and just to consume that free content as well. Okay. All right. Well, keep, keep an eye out. I'm going to track you down here so I can start following you and uh, <laughs> learn, learn more about this. Cause I'm, uh, I'm intrigued. Great. Love to have you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We really appreciate you being here. We, we, there's obviously some very good content here today as well that, uh, that I'm sure your audience and our audience will appreciate. And uh, we look forward to watching your journey as time goes on. Great. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. You bet. Thank you. Thanks, Brooke. <laughs> You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform.